who serves as a very important member of, of the Fly Ranch team, um, as, as an incredible elder in the community who is largely responsible for, among other things, the creation of DPW, the vision of Fly Ranch, um, holding space, and has been doing some incredible work lately. Um, I'd love for you to be able to kick us off. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. So in uh, uh, 1994, I came to my first Burning Man. And uh, I volunteered, like most of you all have volunteered for stuff. And then in 1996, we had a very important year. It was called uh, the Inferno. And a lot of stuff happened that shouldn't have happened. The event got too big to not be organized. So Larry Harvey turned to me after the event. And he goes, Will, will you take on Desert Operations for the next year, 1997? And Desert Operations, till that point, was drawing a circle in, this, in the dust and putting a, a flag in the center, and that's where the man stood, and then you go have a beer. <laughs> that, 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 so I said, sure, I'll do Desert Operations. Well, the BLM wouldn't let us back on the Black Rock. We, I didn't know that when I accepted the job. So we ended up in Washoe County with the Washoe County Festival Permit which is affectionately known as an anti-Woodstock festival permit. And it had a hundred regulations, none of which we could comply with. I'll give you an example how I complied. They wanted flush toilets and lit street corners, right? Cool, right? And so when the compliance guy came, I pulled up in a pickup truck with a generator going, lighting the lights, and a one flush toilet and I said which street corner would you like me to light and he said okay I get it you're gonna do this no matter what we do so he let us go we had the event it was great we learned a lot we learned how to make streets and roads how to separate the cars from the the art and you know a lot of a lot of things it was the first time we bought uh, we actually brought in porta potties until that point the big camps would just bring in their own porta potty. So there was a lot of stuff. Back then, the ticket was $30, 30 bucks. And so the big thing that happened is that I got to live with my crew on the fly ranch for about five months. And we fell in love with the desert together. We fell in love with the fly ranch. We began to drink. And, and we began to dream together about what it could be. Like, what if the Burning Man community actually had Fly Ranch as an access point? What could we do? Well, here we are today. We're trying to fi fix a diseased culture with a diseased culture. And that's not going to work. We need to experiment. We need to experiment in community. We need to experiment in all the facets of what it is to be human on the planet. Um, growing food, making clothes, making shelter. Those are the things that we need a new direction with. Uh, this culture isn't going to fix it as long as there's a profit motive in it. So on the Fly Ranch, to the, to right now, we are beginning to seed new projects that create energy, create community and living space, and eventually some of those will thrive and it'll show humanity a new way to live on the planet in harmony, regeneratively. Um, and that's the dream. That's a dream that, that we all have for Fly. And, and it's beginning to happen. There's two prototype projects already working out there. There was a, a LAGI, uh, LAGI stands for Land Art Gener uh, Generator Initiative. And uh, that's the book that's going around. It's a really good book. Um, and I'd like to build all those projects, quite frankly. They're all fascinating projects. And, and, and the property's big enough. So can we take the, the, the core values that make Black Rock City so special? Can we take the unconditional love, the, the, the spontaneity that happens here, the creative spirit? Creation spirit is earth energy. Earth is the creator of all life. So if you're an artist, you're creating, you're connecting with the earth. So what I hope is that burners will all connect out there with, with their creative energy and create a new place 
And, and, and in the next 20 years, we're going to need a place like Fly. We're going to need a place where we can, you know, be with our community, begin to change the, the way we live on the planet. And that's what I hope that Fly Ranch does. It, it's, a, it's an experiment in how humans can live in harmony on the planet again. I have a book. I'm going to pass it around. It's called Handbook for a Burning Age. It's available on Amazon, although, wait, wait, decommodification. I'm not allowed to say that. That's why they don't invite me to speak at these things much, because I always say the wrong thing. Anyway, buy my book. <laughs> In it is a manifesto that's harsh, um, and I think most of you will get it. You know, the change that, the paradigm shift that we need to make is a big one. We needed to make it about 50 years ago, and we didn't. And even if we make it now, the, the consequences of how we've lived on the planet so far is going to continue into the future. So we need to make it now and not wait. So here's the book. Please take a look. And that's all. I did my spiel. Thank you, Will. Um, as we're getting set up, I'd like to invite uh, some of the logging teams to join me up on stage. Um, Matt, Javier, Moon, uh, Colin, if you're around. Um, you're welcome to come up on stage. We're going to share about those projects in a little bit. Um, thank you. If, if you'd like, yeah. yeah. Um, while we're doing that, um, I would love to just give a, a little bit of a brief primer. Um, and talk about like why Fly is here, why Fly is at BWB, um, and sort of a little bit of what's going going on up there, and, and how that leads to the projects that these folks represent. Um, I love this city. I think it's the greatest city in the world. Um, it is also ephemeral and fleeting, um, and foundationally unsustainable. Um, in 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 my personal experience, the collective project of Fly Ranch is an opportunity to say, cool, what of this incredible, beautiful metropolis can actually and meaningfully transition into the default world? Um, there, there are questions around uh, longevity, around generational shift, around, uh, we, we have things like neighbors and winter and zoning and, and building codes. And like, I don't think that those things are inherently uh, a, a block but we as a culture, you know, we have been out there for about four or five years doing a lot of the type of Burning Man stuff and learning like, oh, this may not be sustainable or regenerative uh, emotionally, physically, environmentally, and so we're trying to relearn those ways. Uh, as, a, as a brief history of Primer, as soon as Burning Man Project bought the property, we did a 14-month environmental baseline study uh, that gave us a strong sense of the flora and the fauna, where there were invasive species, where there was detritus and trash left over that we needed to go pick up, um, where we could start to have activities and what areas we needed to be really considerate of, particularly in the hot springs, in that northern section up on the property. Um, after that, we started doing experimental gatherings. We did something that, that Burning Man does best, uh, which is we picked up trash. We spent about a year and a half doing work weekends out there in partnership with BWB. Um, and, and it was a, a great experience to just start to learn what staying on the land was like um, beyond that, uh, you know, this very specific time in this very specific place, even 12 miles away, there were new things that we needed to learn. Um, Burners Without Borders, where we are, our hosts, our incredible partners, um, a really valuable relationship with Fly Ranch. Um, you know, we have been siblings and peers for, for years and, you know, our community is their community. A lot of the infrastructure that is here is shared at, at Fly Ranch and, and we're out there uh, mostly year round. Generally, our window of operations in terms of public activity is April through October. We do monthly stewardship days. You can come work on the property, soak in the hot springs. Every weekend, the local conservation group, Friends of Black Rock High Rock, is doing nature walks. You can hop on a nature walk, see the guys. Are, it's a three-hour device-free experience. Um, we have a, a volunteer program called The Guardians, which I hope at the end we will get to. Stephen might call on you for that one. Uh, where you can go through an online training, uh, get, get oriented on site, and then have the availability to camp up by the springs and the geysers by yourself for up to a week. It's a really incredible opportunity for you to develop like an emotional relationship with the place and, and a doorway to get involved in Fly Ranch. Um, before we speak specifically about why these folks are on the stage... Oh, I lost Christopher. Oh. 
I wonder if you just speak a little bit about the BWB fly relationship. Um, just this opportunity to say like, hey, what are we doing here? What do we do? And the incredible things that you guys brought to the property as like the first group that came in and said, we want to do our thing there. Thanks, Zach, for that unexpected invitation to speak for a minute. Um, you know, so I think, you know, as Burners Without Borders, one of the things where we started was in disaster relief. And we've really been moving into this idea of community resiliency. And so one of the things that I think about is that we have a lot of amazing uh, systems for power, water, food, waste, shelter. We're working more on transportation, which are many of the same subject areas that these teams are working out on fly for laggy. And we have these temporary models out here in the city. So as we've been partnering with team camps and art projects out in the world, uh, for instance, Square One brought us a whole bunch of containers to do uh, emergency housing after the Santa Rosa fires. And so they've brought their containers out to fly. Um, in order to help house volunteers and have a kitchen out there on site. It's the same thing with the relationships with these ecozoic toilets as well as these nomad tents. These are all people who we've become in, con in contact with through Black Rock City. And now we're starting to say, how can we use that infrastructure year round for more type of, of resources? And I think while Fly is a really amazing model, I think that the more we can do that and the more we can connect with other land projects that other burns are acquiring, like South Africa just got their land this year, Borderlands in Sweden just bought theirs. And so I think what Fly is doing now is creating a model of how do we connect what's happening at our events with our infrastructure and then giving them other places to go. And I think that's part of the cycle that we're trying to help uh, curate through Burners Without Borders. Thanks, Ben. So that's a little bit about Fly. Um, I will say that like most of y'all, we've had a weird couple years. Um, as an understatement. Um, in, in our like Burning Man lexicon, how we did stuff is like, we got people together and we did an event and that was great. Um, and that's what we did for, after that, that baseline study for a couple of years. Um, and then you know, we had this idea of cool, how do we take this, this model of Black Rock City where you know, we work on things like the perimeter, the roads, the bathrooms, uh, you know, placement, and transition that to a year-round space. And one of the ideas of how to do that was a design challenge model. We say, hey, we will invite you not to participate in our solutions, but to understand our problems, to know as much as we know about the property, and then help ideate and create the solutions that can work to then share with the rest of the community that will come after that. Um, it's a really effective model. We partnered with a group called the Land Art Generator Initiative. They had done biennial design challenges in different cities throughout the world. Um, for site-specific installations of art that generate power. In incredible group. Um, I would encourage you to, to check them out. It's Loggy or Land Art Generator Initiative. So we partnered with them and said, you know, we, we have this incredible community with this resilience and ability to build really ambitious and beautiful projects in the desert. And they said, we have this incredible model for open uh, calls, for participation in site-specific installations, for works of art that generate power. And we said, cool, let's take that and level both of those up. So in addition to works of art that generate power, the categories that we invited people to submit to were power, water, shelter, food, and regenerative waste technologies. And we said, come up with a compelling, awe-inspiring, um, never-before-seen, and appropriate-to-site installation that responds to at least one of those categories. Um, you know, we often joke that, like, we, we may have expected, like, a couple of Earthships. And that would have been cool. And we're like, all right, groovy. Um, because of the pandemic, we had to uh, not have our friends over. We couldn't have site visits that we had planned all through the course of that design challenge. We had to put out as much uh, information about the property as we could. We did uh, high-res aerial 3D scans, put all this out, and had to delay the submission window. What happened is that we received projects and inputs uh, on a scale that we could not imagine. Both the, the beauty and the variety and the scale of what we saw was, was incredible. Um, and, and from that, we were just blown away. Um, we had several hundred technical experts that helped winnow those projects down to 55 that actually could work and were appropriate in site. Those are the 55 that are in the book. Uh, and then there was a, a, a short list of 10 that we're working with to start to build. Some of those prototypes have already started, and it's, and it's incredible. I think this is the model by which we will start to build regenerative, I won't say permanent, nothing's permanent, but year-round infrastructure 
that is a baseline that can support larger and larger gatherings. One of the ways that we've been thinking about the project is how do we stay on the site for longer and longer, sustainably, uh, and, and with regenerative intention. We, much like uh, Burning Man Org is out here, are really just administrators. We are here to facilitate and inform um, and, and serve as ambassadors of the space and then invite people in to work on their projects. It is a collective, year-round, stone, soup type project. And, and these people here are all leaders in their, in their projects. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the mic and I would love to just go down that row and have people tell you a little bit about their experiences on the property, what they're up to, why they were even interested in this, and through that, hopefully, you can get a bit of a constellation of, of what this place is, because I, I can't speak to it, I can speak to my own experiences, but I think hearing from other people gives a more um, powerful understanding of the variety, much like Black Rock City, of like what opportunities there are there, what people are doing, and, and why we and they feel it is important. So I will actually start on this end with Jacob, uh, if you don't mind. Awesome, happy folks. Uh, first of all, how cool is this tent? This is like, the Burns Up Borders really realized how much of a circus this place is and like leaned into it, and it's fantastic. Uh, hi, I'm Jacob Mast on my taxes and Simplify on Playa. Uh, I'm one of the leaders for a Ripple Project um, and we're building a big awesome garden, basically. Uh, we've got a dome house in the center with concentric rings of native plant gardens. And the central philosophy is to create a place with a lot of biodiversity from, uh, that will radiate out from, radiate out from that place via uh, you know, birds carrying the seeds and the wind carrying the seeds and people working there to create projects on other places in the land. Uh, like something like 95% of the ground cover at Fly Ranch is invasive plant material. Um, and so a lot of our project circulates around uh, regenerating the relationship that people have with those plants. So we're connecting a lot with the Paiute community, uh, the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe specifically, um, and working on community projects uh, to that effect, which others of us will talk more about, I'm sure. Um, Raph and I moved out to the property uh, three months ago to start a stay that would involve building phase one of our project. Um, went out there in vans with the promise of a uh, windy, dusty place to survive on the moon for three months. And then we got out there and found out it was way more hospitable and Fly has been like very good at under-promising and over-delivering. Um, so our lives have been pretty nice. Uh, but we basically been camping on the land and building a uh, ring of willow, irrigated willow trees to start our project off. Um, there's an element that this place is in my mind, it's wind. And uh, the, the winds are, uh, are really challenging. Growing any kind of plants here is challenging because the pH of the soil is like nine or 10. The water is brackish. The winds are 100 miles an hour. It's a dry lake bed that's been compacted for thousands of years of water. Every hole at Fly Ranch starts with a pickaxe. Um, this has been a tremendous challenge, um, but really staying on the land and getting into with the people, especially developing relationships with the neighbors of neighboring ranches, people in Gerlach, Green Lake Paiute Tribe, Burning Man Project. Um, started working with DPW uh, two months ago and got to participate in the construction of the foundations of this city over the past few months. Um, and it's just been an absolute treat to experience my first burn in a place like this after having experienced Fly Ranch first and seeing that these kinds of acts of regenerative community building and um, you know ecosystem stuff is kind of at the heart of like what we're all doing here. Um, I think this space generally is a place to take a step back and consider what it really means to be like people in a society together and like dissolve a lot of the constructs that were limiting us maybe um, and define what really matters to us. Um, so, yeah, you know, we're, we're very aware that Ripple is like a 30 year plus project. You know, we're going to be done with physical building for the most part within three years or so. Um, you can check out more at flyripple.org. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just keep the mic going around. I'm a new John City of the Seed team. I'm going to keep it brief and let our team lead, Colin, handle the intro, so let the suspense build. What's up, guys? My name is uh, Tim Schwartz, and I'm part of the Starship, which is a healing communal space. And what really is the Starship? It's family. And uh, I was over at the camp out a few months ago, and I met this awesome man right here, Jacob. And he's like, dude, we're starting a camp at Burning Man, Fly Ranch family. Tim, what are you going to bring? And at that point, I had no thoughts of going to Burning Man, but I have 50 acres outside of Sedona, and the county said, you can't have a container on your land. So I'm like, all right, let's move the container to Burning Man. And here we are. Um, 
so yeah, the Starship actually is here, guys. I invite you all to come to Regenerates or Degenerates. I think I'm more of a degenerate, um, if you haven't already. Uh, what am I, if you want to find out what the Starship is, it's here. Um, I have a lot of anger. It's hard for me to be a human being. <laughs> So I created a neon rage room. I, I pitch it as if Daft Punk and Office Space met at a Slipknot concert and made passionate love. It's a black lit room. We spray painted the printers neon and you rage, you get your anger out on some printers and we're collecting that debris and turning that into an art sculpture by another artist. And uh, you know, what the special thing that we have at that camp, uh, which you guys are all staying with us, is it truly feels like family. You know, Matt right here brought his, his dad and his sister and there's a young man named Max who did his high school project on the Fly Ranch. His plus one was his mom. You know, it, it's community. You know, we need these spaces to bring people together and that's what the, the Starship is. And I recently, today, actually visited, synchronistically, I didn't even know that they were here, uh, Squared One, which basically provides the kitchen at Fly Ranch. And I met their, their team lead, Lee, who has an identical vision like me, but just called uh, an octagon-like shaped structure. And I told him, I pitched him my idea, and I'm trying to get a prototype at Fly. And you go to their camp at Squared One, our prototype that I did with Alexi, which we actually did a proposal to Fly, is exactly what they have at their camp. And I was like, Lee, I'm trying to make my prototype at Fly. Like, what are you doing with these containers when they're not at Burning Man? It's like, they're, they're in storage. If you can get Zach or Chef over at 360 to agree, you've got the Starship prototype. So here you go. I, I hope we can bring the Starship prototype to fly or 360. And hey, I invite you guys all to come to our camp. And our family is having a little family kickoff party uh, tomorrow night. You know, we're going to have a little neon glow party in the container with two DJs. Actually, one of them is a pretty well known DJ named Skysia, who's camping in our camp. And we're going to have a couple art cars. And we're, after the art cars, the DJs actually perform they're gonna go to Deep Playa. So I invite, we have a big block party, you guys mob over, we'll mob over to the Deep Playa. Thank you. Hi there, it's Javier from Mondays of Water. Uh, our project is focused on water catchment techniques. Um, they are kind of quite rustic, we could say. There's nothing innovative about that. We can uh, we follow different examples all over the world about the indigenous techniques. What I think it's important, or what we wanted to take into account, is that there is um, how we put this knowledge that we already have it, and how we read this landscape. We we come from Europe. We are far away, and we were just amazed about the place. We saw the images. We we love the community of the Burning Man, and we started to to read this place, to, to see all, all the images we had. Uh, you, you probably know or not, there is uh, much more water uh, in the fly ranch than here in all sort of forms. Uh, there is under one, uh, underwater, groundwater, there is hazers, there is uh, run of water, all, of, all because of the, the mountains nearby. It's called Granite Range, it's like over here. So, in general, we are uh, in the Great Basin region. There is a specific uh, pattern of mountain uh, basin range, basin range, basin, basin range topography. It's a kind of a specific uh, morphology. If you go to Google Maps, you will see in the satellite the pattern. And when I when I was saying about the, how like the trying to understand like the deepness of time. Uh, we looked about this, this energy that we could, from tectonics to indigenous techniques to the, 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 the stories they made, and we decided to focus on this water, on, 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 on the subject. Uh, when we look at the images, they were like, you could say like grasslands, water spaces, dry spaces, ever changing in, in time. And our goal would be to, how to take these techniques, this knowledge, and how to put it together with this place. At this point, we're gonna intervene mainly in one of the streams in, in, the, in the middle fly ranch. Uh, now it is very eroded because as you know, in arid lands, uh, there is no much water. The, the soil is dry, so it, it gets very compacted. And when it rains, it erodes everything and it wipes out the, all, all what is there. 
So the 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 intervention would be like some uh, earth and stone dikes, which will fo uh, slow down the water, uh, allows infiltration on the soil, allows it to settle down, so as to uh, let the environment grow again, have a, a water catchment less intrusive, that will be able to let the water flow again to the playa as well. Uh, and we are figuring out little by little, yeah. Hi everyone, um, this is Moon. First I want to give a shout out to my fellow um, participants in the design challenge and Matt and Jacob for making this camp happen. That a lot for a lot of us it's the first time in Burning Man, so it's really special. In a way kind of ground truthing our vision for Fly Ranch. Um, uh, for me and my partner who's not here this time, we've been wanting to do, come to Burning Man for years. But, you know, it's hard to really understand what it means. So when we saw the design challenge, what we did was we started reading a lot about this place. Um, you know, about Burning Man, there's this transient, ephemeral um, quality to it. People come together for a week and you're gone. And then I think Fly Ranch presents a very unique opportunity because you bring that spirit, that builder's quality, um, that mindset to build something all year round and really making something good for the environment and for the land. So, um, and then also shout out to Matt and Zach who did tremendous foundational work to Fly Ranch because when we started, we, there's so many materials that we were like looking at, including like plant species, animal species, um, soil condition. So those really provide a lot of in, uh, inspiration and things we can refer to. Um, so we, as we dug deeper, we were really fascinated by the land history. I think land stewardship is really the key of this project um, because you know it's gonna stay there for however long. So we, were, we wanted to learn from the Paiute culture how they've built their shelters for, from hundreds of years ago, which is totally low tech, probably foraging, pick up things dry wood, dry grass, and then they can, they're able to provide a shelter for themselves. And while maintaining this equilibrium or harmony with the land. So that's the main construction uh, inspiration for us. And then um, another thing about land stewardship is, I mean, we are here. And I think we're thinking more as like people, as the inhabitants. Um, but then, as I mentioned, there are so many species. And then in fact, they all have different needs in their inhabit. Um, habitat, like what they prefer to eat, what, how they prefer to live. It's different from mammals, from anthropos, or other animals. So that's another thing, another inhabitant that we want to include in our project. Um, so essentially, our all our construction material is recycled wood or grass. And then, for example, in the facade, if we use thatching and dry reed, it provides a space. Uh, although it's small, but it's creating a space that other animals can live in. And, um, and then having that ephemeral um, aspect to it, that it can decay and it's fine. We can let it decay and then we come back and then we can repair it. So I think that's a reminder of how we live with this environment that things go come and go. So that's another thing we want to bring into our project. Um, our project's name is called Lodgers, if you want to take a look in the book. Uh, lodgers, lodgers. So everyone is the lodgers, inhabitants of the land. Um, and so it's me and my partner, and then we are both architectural designers, urban designers, um, with eco uh, ecology background. And I would really love if any one of you is interested taking care of the land, taking care of animals. Um, we'd love to have more folks criticism, constructive criticism <laughs> in any way. So we'd love to chat with anyone of you if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Moon. Oh. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Matt Raphael. And uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, Wow, talk about waking dreams, the theme of Burning Man this year. This, uh, the last like 28 months have been 
complete waking dream for me and a lot of people on our team. And uh, yeah, just super grateful for this experience um, to be working alongside such brilliant minds and uh, beautiful hearts. So, uh, you know, Jacob gave a good intro about uh, what we're doing at, with Ripple. Um, but, you know, we're building a basically a station for the regeneration of uh, ecological knowledge and native biodiversity. And, you know, I never thought that uh, any of this would be possible after, you know, early on in the pandemic getting laid off and a few friends from University of Maryland gathering and uh, just coming together, starting working on something. And, you know, one thing just led to the next and uh, something, you know, this just formed and um, it's just been evolving and growing ever since. Um, so, you know, it's really special that we're able to work on such impactful projects like at Fly Ranch. And, um, you know, we're really part of a larger vision of what's going on at, at Fly Ranch. So with all these different laggy teams and fitting in the even larger Burning Man, you know, vision. Um, so as far as our impact with Ripple, um, you know, we're really focused on cultural and ecological resilience. Um, so I'll let Izzy speak for a minute about the uh, the Pyramid Lake Paiute um, Ethnobotanical Garden we've been working, but it's just a um, an offshoot of Ripple at Fly Ranch. Um, you know, just as the the seeds in the seed bank in the center of Ripple spread outwards and create a ripple effect by you know growing new trees and those trees drop their seeds and those seeds blow in the wind and create new trees and the ripple effect um, builds, is building ecological resilience with a little bit of human love. Um, we're able to do the same thing culturally by inspiring different cultures and communities uh, surrounding uh, this ripple base to take action in their own communities. Um, so just as the seeds uh, cause the ripple effect, so, so we can do the same culturally. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks for having me. This is Colin from uh, Seed, from uh, Project Seed. Uh, we heard a lot about the land. 10,000 foot mountains come down to a couple thousand foot foothills. There's alfalfa field, and then that drops down to the playa. So you can have the mountains at your back and the sun sets over them and the sun rises over the playa. It's incredibly beautiful. The hot springs, the lakes, the reservoirs, the uh, all the different diversity. It's really an amazing place. But what I want to talk about is the context uh, because we believe all land is sacred and there's beautiful land everywhere. and. Um, the important thing about this project is the context. This isn't happening in isolation, this is happening at a time of rapid acceleration of climate change. Uh, it's happening at a time of rapid acceleration of technical, technical acceleration. It's causing uh, incredible pressure on cities, it's causing a pressure on us uh, emotionally. We find that people are looking to connect with each other and are looking for opportunities to rethink the way they live. And then this land isn't owned by Goldman Sachs. This land is a nonprofit uh, owned by Burning Man. So there's a lot of context there. So when we look at that context and we say, we don't have a lot of time. The world's changing super rapidly. What can we do to create a seed of change that could, if you look at Burning Man, and you know, I don't know how many people come out of Burning Man saying like, that was amazing. How do we take this into our lives? How do we make Burning Man sustainable, not just ecologically, but socially, um, work-wise, you know, could we eat dinner together, care for each other, gift uh, each other, leave no trace? How do, we, how do we take these principles, but how do we take this community and keep this going? So we believe there's this distributed city in our future that um, the nature of cities is changing, that it can be, um, that Burning Man itself is a distributed city. The city exists when it's not in BRC. And we think it can manifest itself on Fly Ranch, and we think it can do it in a way that's um, both nourishing and expanding to the individual, so we can live our best lives, but we can also show up for our community, and we can show up for our planet. So the project itself, is a um, it's an intervention in the land. So we looked at the most scarred part of the land, which we feel is the alfalfa farm. It's a few hundred acres, and our proposal is to um, to work with the earth to use the materials that are on site to build a regenerative city. And this uh, we create microclimates by 
digging in the earth, taking out uh, soil sometimes maybe as big as this tent. So we have a depression in which we can plant trees. If you look in the desert and you look where the plants are growing, they're in the little nooks and crannies. You're out of the wind, plants that have a chance to propagate, um, you're able to out of the direct sun. And so what do we do with that, that soil that we pull up? And I'm gonna point to Max, one of our architects over there, um, who came up with this beautiful analogy of a sine wave. We, we scoop out the earth and then we build an earthen house on top of that. We believe it should be a communal house where people can come together to cook, to do yoga, to have talks like this, to co-work. Three years ago, this wouldn't have been an, a, a possibility. Uh, what's changed in the past three years? Remote work. Uh, who here has experienced remote work in the past three years? Uh, who's here has experienced isolation and loneliness, perhaps, out of that? So why can't we remote work together? Why can't we create a community as loving, caring, supportive, um, tolerant, and open as this in a place where we can come and go? We don't have to live there forever, but we can, we can um, use that as a home base. So, the, um, so we're growing up, you know, food, and the, the project encompasses food production, and we've got this uh, pit-based agriculture that we've developed. It includes the earth houses that we're building, which are the earth is ambient 50 degrees year round. So when you build thick earthen walls, it's uh, cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. We imagine you know courtyards with cold plunges and hot springs and radiant floor heating and just beautiful uh, natural building materials. Um, but really this is a community project. We call it community is art. And so how do we develop this into a long-term um, community and I was going to say the, the three th three reasons why this wouldn't have been a possibility a couple of years ago is um, there's no internet <laughs> uh, Starlink came with Starlink came jobs that I personally am more qualified for and we can have a, a larger number of people contributing on a global scale not just locally we think the local is important but we all think also think global impact is important uh, and then community there's a cool community uh, dog ranch just down the street, but it's maybe 20, 30 people uh, doing their thing. What if we had a couple hundred or a couple thousand of people who were uh, maybe coming and going for months at a time? We think those three things, you know, being able to get on the internet, being able to um, work productively globally through, through internet, and then having a community really makes this possible and it really only is possible I think to take this kind of bold experiment because Burning Man is behind it because there is more than just a profit motive this is uh, about um, you know we think this isn't a radical proposal we think this is a uh, rational response to an extreme situation so we need to do everything we can to make change in the world at scale and we think with a million people who identify as burners, there is an amazing community to kick this off and to see this replicate because as amazing, beautiful, and huge as Fly Ranch is, 4,000 acres is not enough to make the change that we want to see in the world to avert a uh, potential disaster. And so this is really a, a project about inspiration, about you know, if you see all the theme camps here, you know, someone started using Black Rock Shade, I'm sure Will could tell us when that, what ha when that happened, but then that propagated throughout the entire community and all the technology and all the techniques did as well. And so we think that this is an opportunity for us to prototype not only the building uh, techniques, but also the community techniques and how those will propagate. Um, John, one of our architects, uh, you know, able to answer questions about the building, the design, Max as well. I'm here to answer any questions about weird philosophical things about why we're doing this. But um, thank you so much to Zach and Matt and just Joe and Will Rogers and the, the whole Fly Ranch team. And uh, just super honored to be able to be up here with this group and to be able to be partnering with someone who is willing to take the chance uh, to really address these incredibly uh, important systemic issues that we face. What's your name?
Okay, I, I'm gonna, you heard my rap before. I'm gonna try to go down a different river. Um, I'm gonna start with a quote. Um, and the framework of the quote is really the problem that we have with destroying nature with Western culture, it's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy thing to solve. It, it's, it's, a, it's an existential problem. It has to do with belief systems and allegiances. And, oh boy, and we're all programmed from birth to be a consumer. And we've got to fix all that. So this is a quote from, I believe, a Finnish mathematician. We believe in an invisible God while we destroy a visible nature, not realizing that the nature that we're destroying is the God that we're worshiping. That's kind of how I've been feeling, you know? So, uh, Fly Ranch is a, a beautiful place on the planet. It's the Mother Earth expresses herself there in many, many ways. One way is the geyser, which is one of the most feminine things I think I've ever experienced. Just the noise from it. No one's mentioned the geyser, which is crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's otherworldly. So I, I go, used to go there to visit just to hear the sound of running water and to look at this anamorphic thing that, that nature is making that changes. It changes almost day to day. I mean, it's remarkable. It's just beautiful. So about 10 years ago, I realized that one of the millions of things wrong with Western culture was it had no rituals that, that had to do with honoring the earth. There was none. I mean, you know, earth is a resource. Wow, how wrong is that? So anyway, we, we, we don't respect the earth, we don't honor the earth, we see it as a resource, we rape it, we drill it, and, and, we, and we call that happiness. I just didn't get it. So in my own personal life, I can only be di directly responsible for what I do. I can be an example, that's nice when that happens, it rarely happens. Um, but at least I could take the first step and, and try in my own life to create a ritual that connects me with the earth. And that, that connection for me is actually pretty strong compared to most people. I've spent most of my life backpacking and camping and you know seeing some of the great awesome sites that the earth has to hold. I've been able to do that. And I began to look at it uh, how can I connect with my heritage? So humans, um, Homo erectus, has now been, it keeps getting moved back, the timeline. It's now eight million years. We've been screwing up the, the Earth, depending on where you look at it from. It's either 4,000 years, which is the way I look at it, or if you look at just from the 1700s on when we started burning coal really heavy. So just a few hundred years. Well, that's not even the paint on the end of that eight million year yardstick. And we call ourselves an advanced civilization and we're exterminating ourselves. Wow, So a lot to make up here and a lot to think about. So my, my uh, partner, my wife, Crimson Rose, is a labyrinth lover, so she she said, uh, Will, can I build a labyrinth in our backyard in Gerlach? And I said, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so she did the little stones. I got me to do all the big stones. And it took us a uh, summer to build it. And then I walked it. And I realized that what I had in common with eight million years of humanity on the planet is that we walk. We walk and we dream. We walk and we think. We walk. We walk. So I began to see that what Jung and Freud called the collective unconscious was really the common consciousness. We're born with it. We're born with that connection to every human that's ever been on the planet. And it's one planet, one humanity, one Earth, one humanity. We all come from the same collection of stardust that the Earth is made of. 
We're part of the universe. So I began just innocently walking the labyrinth and it became, I have an addictive personality, and it became addictive. I, I started to do it every night. And I continue to walk a labyrinth every night. I take pictures. Anybody know me on Facebook for my sunsets? A few of you. Yeah. I do it every night. I, I'm probably the most consistent person in the world. Wow. And, and uh, uh, I, I started to feel that connection. I started to feel, I could almost hear it. Like, they call it tinnitus. And that's kind of the noise of the universe in your ears. And you should develop uh, a relationship with that. It's really good. And I began to see the world in a different way. Humans walking on the planet, our heritage. The, the indigenous people know about heritage, but our economy wants us to have individual consumers. There's no money in your heritage, so let's wipe that out of our learning. So we call it the uncommon consciousness. You can bring it up. You can bring it up with the sound of running water, the sound of thunder, lightning, uh, orgasm. All of those things are things that humans have done for eight million years. You're connected to all of that. So I use the labyrinth for that. Everybody can use a labyrinth for their own, their own um, intention. I mean, intention is everything, isn't it? When you do something with a certain intention, that's the result that you get. If you don't have an intention, you're not going to get a result. So then about, I don't know, was it three years ago? About three years ago, um, uh, Crimson wrote a proposal for Zach and Matt to look at, and, and uh, it was to build a, a labyrinth and fly. And so we built, we spent that summer, that was the first year of the pandemic. And we thought we were going to get all this volunteer help, and it was me and Crimson. <laughs> we had the dump truck of rocks put downhill from where we were placing them, so I had to go uphill with all the, the rocks in a wheelbarrow. Wow. took us all summer to build it, and we built the, they're called courses. So uh, the, the labyrinth that, uh, labyrinths go back in, in petroglyphs for tens of thousands of years in human history, right? Um, they were developed even more in the Minoan culture, and if you look at the Minoan culture, there's an interesting thing that both mining and agriculture were developed by the Minoans. So, really, if you look at the path that humans have taken away from the Garden of Eden, it started about 5,000 years ago with the Minoans. Uh, the last time we lived in harmony on the earth was 5,000 years ago, before we started mining and agriculture, so think about that. So anyway, we, we uh, made a labyrinth to fly. It has a four foot wide course so that a wheelchair can do it. And uh, we saw someone, uh, I think about two months ago, in a wheelchair actually do the labyrinth. We, we go there every Sunday at two o'clock and open it to the public. And I know some of you have walked it, which is really cool. And, and the labyrinth could be, or just the, the idea of a ritual walk could be something that helps connect you with the earth again. And uh, certainly that's something we all need. We're more connected to our iPhones and social media and what the Kardashians are wearing than we are to the earth. There's something wrong with that. Hello everybody. Um, I'm Izzy, uh, easy peasy as well. Um, I'm part of the Ripple Project, one of the leads, um, specifically in plants. Um, this has been quite an, a learning experience for me and a learning journey for me and my own personal growth as I understand sustainability, stewardship, and the creation of community and culture. Through uh, my studies of just learning the plants, the native plant material that would be coming and being introduced into the area, I really started to dive into the Numu culture, which was the original, some of the indigenous people into the Northern Nevada region. In their studies, I learned much about the stewardship techniques that were practiced and how they used, they were already practicing sustainable practices <laughs> uh, hundreds of years ago and for many years and was quite successful. Um, and things did not change until the Anglo-Europeans got introduced into the areas. That's when everything became uh, commercialized and ownership became introduced. 
the concept of ownership is actually what uh, has brought us down this spiral of downfall because ownership does not revolve around giving back. It just revolves around taking and taking and taking and taking and taking and taking. And taking. Um, across my learning, I learned about the story of Sky Woman and I learned the story of Adam and Eve. And if you think about it, these stories have two very different meanings at the core. While Sky Woman, who descended from the sky, learned to work with the animals, the plants, and give back and create a unified ecosystem, the story of Adam and Eve taught us of uh, humans being banished for eating a fruit and being cast out of heaven into the wilderness, which they had to dominate and be in charge of. And these stories of Sky Women's uh, practice and practitioners of Adam and Eve ended up in many bloody battles because they would clash in their own understanding of life. I'm very proud that we are doing community work with the New Moon Tribe and the local communities and I think that's very much the first step in healing the culture in this area. You know, I think all of us have to be aware of the history of the abuse, of the traumas that have been created on this land from uh, people like me, you know, I'm not from here. You know, my, my heritage is not from America. So I think we need to come to terms with where our history comes from and what even our past generations have done to this land. And it's our, now it's up to us to repair a lot of that. You know, and a lot of it is just learning about the history. Um, I'm proud to say we did an ethno, we donated an ethno botanical garden to the Pyramid Lake Museum. Uh, we installed it this past summer. If you please are driving through Nixon, please stop by. Um, we worked with Billy Jean, the director of, of uh, the Pyramid Lake Museum. We worked with Teresa, who is a high school native studies teacher. Um, we worked with Dean, who works for the Land Bureau Management. Um, and it's, I think, the first step towards re-establishing a good connection with the, with the indigenous folks who actually truly understand what real stewardship of this land is. They understand it, they understand 100%. And I think that's a place where we should all be starting and moving towards. Um, I also want to give a thanks to Erica, because I know they didn't say hello to you, and Inspector Steve and Brace and Annie, who also have been very helpful um, at Fly Ranch with everything. Um, yeah, I'm proud to be a part of this. I hope to continue doing great work and I appreciate everybody's support. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Uh, I wanna give everyone here just a lot of love for what they're doing. Um, thank you guys for, for chatting. And for, and for being a part of the project. Um, this is the Fly Ranch leadership in terms of community and, and, and people that are not here on the stage and a lot of other people out there. I would love to just do a quick like show of hands. If you have been involved in any way in a project at Fly Ranch, please just raise your hand because I know there's quite a few people out there. Uh, Thank you for being a part of this project. For those of you that haven't, I would love to invite you in to join. There are a number of ways to do that. In lieu of a Q&A, um, we're gonna have a little bit of like a, a social hour, social 45 minutes here. Uh, we've got a, a, a new Fly Ranch uh, silkscreen logo thing. If you've got a t-shirt, you wanna get that on. If you wanna come and chat with any of these folks here. Um, and so I would invite you to, to come up and, and join and talk to any of these people. Very briefly, before, before Will closes us out, I just want to say um, flyranch.org, flyranch at burningman.org. As mentioned, we do monthly stewardship, days, monthly stewardship days where you can come work on land restoration, landscape scale stewardship projects. You can come and, and join and be a Fly Ranch guardian and come and camp out and, and soak up both the energetic and, and the beauty uh, of that space. Um, Nature Walks, if you want to join and be a docent, work with a local conservation group, bring people into that, that real doorway for like, maybe they just saw the guys are on National Geographic and they're like, I want to see that thing. And then they sort of get this real potent drop of like, oh, there's a lot going on here. Um, there, there are a lot of ways to get involved. Um, we, we will be here. You can chat with either myself, Matt, and wait in orange in the back. Matt, you want to throw a hand up? Yeah. Go bend his ear. 
Um, I'm, I'm glad you could take some time while there's so much going on out there to, to join us. I will just put another plug for the fact that like, we out here all year round. Um, and, and that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a lot of work. As Colin was saying like, there's not a lot of time to, to right some of these wrongs. Um, and we would love to have anyone involved that wants to be involved. Start a project, support a project, volunteer, get involved. Will? So, every day I look at the science and technology, science and environment sections of the many newspapers. We've got wars going on, we've got, oh, drought, we've got floods, we've got the apocalypse, it's, it's on us, you know, it's, it's like, it, it's pretty hard to be positive, you know? Um, and it's easy to give up. But you know what makes me feel like there's a chance for the future? It's you. It's the Burning Man community. It's the Fly Ranch. It's initiatives like this. Let's save the world together. Thank you all for coming. Like I said, we'll be hanging out for about the next 45 or an hour. Welcome to chat with anyone here. Appreciate you coming. Enjoy your Burning Man, everybody.